times the charm. So uh, now we are going to actually try to kick off the talk that I had introduced uh, shortly before. Please take it away, Rupnik. I'll be speaking to you today about PureCake, which is a verified compiler for a lazy functional language. And this is joint work with several others. When we're implementing critical software, we might consider what are the guarantees that our choice of language provides us? What properties does it check? How does it aid our reasoning and reduce bugs? Considering, for example, C, ML, and Haskell, we might say that C doesn't give us very many guarantees. It can be non-trivial to avoid undefined behavior in its semantics. ML generally gives us type safety and memory safety from type checking and garbage collection. And Haskell gives us a lot more besides, including clear demarcation of pure and IO computations, referential transparency, laziness, and free theorems. We also need to worry about binary level guarantees. What happens when we take our code in these languages, compile them to a binary, and run them on actual hardware? What are the guarantees we get then? End-to-end -end verified compilation is a guaranteed way to preserve source level behavior at the binary. And for C-like and ML-like languages, we have Compsert and KCML, two end-to-end -end verified compilers that will take source code to the same semantics in the binary. For Haskell, there seems to be a bit of a gap. So we're in an unfortunate position where a language with a lot of guarantees doesn't have a verified route to a binary. Until pure cake, that is. We focus particularly on verified compilation because we're worried about reasoning about our programs. How do we reason about what actually executes on the hardware? This comes down to knowing two things. What do our source programs do, i.e., what is their semantics? And second, do we have a compiler that will definitely preserve that same understanding of our semantics? We might trust industrial strength compilers like GHC to be bug-free in all the ways that matter, but do we trust that the semantics it implicitly implements is really the one inside our own heads? Verified compilation gives us a verified link between a formally specified, clear source semantics, which we can reason about, and a compiler which definitely preserves that same semantics. So then, PureCake is a compiler verified using the whole 4 interactive theorem prover for a lazy, purely functional language which is inspired strongly by Haskell and which will ultimately target KML, where KML is this end-to-end -end verified implementation of a subset of ML. Other than verified compilation, we have lots of key contributions to the PureCake project, including some which we think haven't been mechanically verified before, even in isolation, such as two-phase constraint-based type inference, demand analysis, and monadic reflection, that is the transformation of monadic code to imperative code. I'll start by considering the source language that PureCake accepts. It's known as PureLang, and it has standard functional features, such as general recursion, shown here by the factorial function, algebraic data types and pattern matching, exemplified by the map function over lists, and higher order functions, allowing us to map that factorial function over a list of numbers. More than standard functional idioms, it has features mostly associated with Haskell, such as laziness. Expressions are only computed as deeply as they are inspected and not recomputed on reuse, so we can easily construct infinite data structures. By default, all pure lang functions are pure, and we have monads which provide monadic sequencing, stateful computation, and I.O. In particular, we provide a single I.O. monad, which has mutable arrays, its exception handling, and interaction with the surrounding execution environment via FFI calls. We also inherit other features from Haskell, like indentation-sensitive syntax, do notation, mutually recursive top-level definitions, and more. Formally, we specify this syntax using two ASTs, allowing us to separate our implementation and verification. We consider compiler expressions CE and semantic expressions E. And compiler expressions are a higher level syntactic sugar for semantic expressions. They'll de-sugar to them. It's most convenient to phrase our compiler over compiler expressions, so these are the ones we use in implementation. They include constructs like case. In contrast, it's most convenient to phrase our semantics over semantic expressions, so these will provide the ground truth for our semantics. And we de-sugar case expressions into more primitive constructor operations, such as testing for name and arity and projecting out arguments. Our operational semantics is defined in three layers. The first is weak head evaluation in the functional big step style. That is a call by name, clocked or fueled recursive interpreter. It tries to produce a weak head form from an expression, but it might run out of clock and so time out. We lift this to unclocked evaluation using classical quantification in whole force logic. The unclocked evaluation of an expression E is either a weak head form if the clocked evaluation can produce that without timing out, or it must be the case that the clocked evaluation always times out, and so the unclocked one does too. 
Third and last, we statefully interpret I.O. operations. Each I.O. operation in the I.O. monad is considered a weak head form, and now we have to model their sequencing and stateful and I.O. effects. So we use a stack machine with mutable store. It accepts a weak head form, a continuation stack kappa, mutable store sigma, and produces a variant of interaction trees which are embeddable in whole four and will serve as our semantic domain. The top level semantics of an expression is a combination of these. It's the stateful interpretation of the weak head form in an empty continuation stack and empty initial store. Over our operational semantics, we mechanize an equational theory, choosing untyped duplicative by simulation from Abramsky's lazy lambda calculus. We prove that this is congruent using Howe's method, that is, expressions composed of bisimilar sub-expressions are themselves bisimilar. We also define three standard notions of equivalence. Alpha equivalence, E1 and E2 are alpha equivalent if we can convert their bound variables. Beta equivalence, a function accepting X with body E1 when applied to argument E2 is beta equivalent to substituting in E2 into a freshened version of the body E1, where we've renamed its bound variables to avoid capture of the free variables of E2. And contextual equivalence. E1 is contextually equivalent to E2 if they have equal semantics under all closing contexts. We can then see how these interact with our equational theory. And we find that contextual equivalence coincides precisely, and both alpha and beta equivalents are subsumed, exactly as we might hope. Let's move now to the compiler itself. And it looks a bit like this. We accept pure lang on the left, go through the front end in blue, the back end in red, and then target KML at the end. We'll start by considering the front end, focusing on type inference and demand analysis. We choose to pursue a two-phase constraint-based type inference approach. We generate all typing constraints in a single syntax traversal and only attempt to solve them later after the traversal. The approach is taken out of the Helium teaching compiler for Haskell, in particular its top framework. This is designed for very clear, precise error messages and supports a lot of Haskell 98. The idea is that in the future, PureCake can do the same. We prove that if, if, if inference succeeds, it must be the case we can generate some constraints according to the top typing framework, which are in fact solvable. And overall, these imply well typing. Last in the front end is demand analysis, whose goal is to avoid excessive heap allocations. Considering the factorial function we saw earlier, each recursive call is doing a multiplication, the accumulator times n. But in a lazy language, this multiplication isn't evaluated until it's inspected in the final recursive call. So each recursive call allocates a thunk or a suspended computation onto the heap, which is quite wasteful. The goal of demand analysis is to see that eagerly evaluating the accumulator doesn't change semantics. So we can use Haskell's seek operator to annotate this code, and future optimizations will ensure that no thunks are allocated for the accumulator. We formalize a notion of demands. An expression E demands a set of variables xn if it is equivalent in our equational theory to eagerly evaluating each one of these variables before itself. We can then implement and verify an analysis which faithfully extracts these demands. And almost by construction, we can transform code with these seek annotations, including in recursive functions like the one at the top of the slide. There's a slight caveat to how we choose to verify a demand analysis. We use an alternative equational theory which is slightly weaker following prior work. It's weaker in one very strict sense. It considers stuck or ill-typed or crashing programs to be equivalent to those that diverge, both as sort of a bottom element in a semantics. Now we have to be careful that we don't convert between crashing and diverging programs. Fortunately, we know that for well-typed code, both of these things coincide because well-typed programs can't crash. Demand analysis receives well-typed code from inference, and we, presume, we prove it preserves well-typing. Now we can consider the compiler back end. So that is the stuff at the bottom of this slide in red. Three intermediate languages, thunklang, nblang, and statelang. First, though, an aside on how we choose to implement and verify a compiler back end. In previous work, including KCML, we define a code transformation function and then verify it very directly to be semantics preserving, subject to some syntactic well-formness conditions. Here, we separate our implementation and verification more clearly. We consider syntactic relations over semantic expressions and code transformations over compiler expressions. The idea is that the syntactic relations are the things we actually verify to be semantics preserving. They're general enough to carve out an envelope of possible implementations. Then when we implement the compiler, we show that it is one of these implementations in the envelope. That is, we prove that subject to syntactic well-formness conditions, the action of the compiler after desugaring inhabits the syntactic relation. This has two key benefits. The first is modularity. We can update the compiler implementation easily as long as we stay within the implementation envelope carved out by the syntactic relation. The second is ease of verification. 
Syntactic relations can be very non-concrete and assume existence of strategies for inventing fresh variables, for example, without actually worrying about how those are implemented. We can also break down complicated code transformation into several smaller syntactic relations to make their verification more tractable. So with that aside done, let's move back to the back end. The first intermediate language in the back end is called thunklang, and it brings an immediate transition to a call-by-value semantics from pure lang's call-by-name. So naturally, we implement thunks, suspended or delayed computations which can later be forced. The semantics of a delayed computation is to immediately produce a thunk value without ever inspecting the underlying expression. A force is going to undo a delay, so it expects a thunk value as its input, which it will then unwrap and evaluate underneath. And just to note here, these thunks are pure, so reforcing a thunk is going to re-incur its entire computation. There's no value sharing yet. We're going to implement that later in the compiler. We also perform some optimization in thunklang, reducing harmful code patterns, and trying to uh, perform some common sub-expression elimination to reduce repetitively forced thunks. We use seven syntactic relations to verify three compiler passes in thunklang, demonstrating how we break things down into smaller steps to ease verification. In state lang, the final intermediate language, we'll do quite a bit. We're going to compile away the IO monad to effectful primitives, and we're going to share thunk values using mutable arrays. So to state lang syntax, we introduce primitive effects and remove the thunk operations delay and force, and the monadic operations return, bind, and so on. Now that we've removed these monadic operations, we don't need this third layer of our semantics, the stateful interpretation. So we specify our semantics more directly as a CESK machine. When I say we compile away the I.O. monad, what I mean is each monadic operation is converted to a suspended computation which under the hood uses effectful primitives. When we apply this lambda to a unit, that triggers its effects, its sequencing, its I.O. in the correct order. To see how we do value sharing, let's have a look at how we compile force. So force of E, to compile force of E, we compile E to E prime and assign it to X. And recall that force expects a thunk value as its input. In state lang, this is represented with a thunk array a two-place array, the first element of which is a flag, saying, have we forced this thunk before or not? If the flag is true, we have a final resulting value. If it's false, we have a suspended computation in the second element. So to force such a thunk array, we check the flag. If it's true, we can immediately return the value. If it's false, then we need to trigger the suspended computation by applying it to unit, which I've elided here, and then update the mutable array, storing the flag as true and storing the final resulting value. We also perform some optimization within state lang simplifying these suspended computations and their applications to unit. So having kind of briefly looked at the compiler back end, we can now compose with KML and derive an end-to-end -end correctness theorem for PureCake. And it looks a bit like this. If the PureCake compiler takes a string to some KML AST, and the KML compiler takes that to some machine code, and we correctly install this code in the memory of a machine, then there must be a compiler expression which is produced by the PureCake front end after parsing and type checking, and we must have a machine semantics which prunes the pure lang level semantics of the compiler expression. What I mean by pruning here is that these are equivalent semantics up to out of memory errors. On the left hand side, the machine semantics has finite memory, it can run out. On the right hand side, pure lang has notionally infinite memory. So this end to end correctness theorem overall spans from pure lang compiler expressions all the way down to machine code. Thanks very much for listening. I'll take any questions. For questions and start with your name and affiliation. Hi, very nice talk, thanks. Um, Amal Ahmed, Northeastern. <laughs> um, quick clarification, are, are you assuming that you're compiling whole programs, that you never link with anything after Yes, we are assuming whole program Okay, Because you mentioned FFIs somewhere in the middle of the talk, so that's why I was wondering. Sorry? You mentioned FFIs in the, uh, somewhere early yes. in the talk? Uh, that made me wonder. So the FFI is connects, inherited then. from KML. It's how uh, KML programs interact just generally with the outside environment. But it's, uh, we have a C FFI wrapper, yeah. which is sort of in the trusted compute base. Um, but it's not general language interoperability. Okay. All right. Thanks. I have a question which is around one uh, canonical use of, of laziness, which is stream transformers that are kind of modeling reactive systems. Just thinking about it on one level, basic input and output, but trying to make that look nicely functional. And there are ways to compile that kind of code where, for instance, there's no allocation and, and it's a pretty uh, direct first order kind of program that comes out. 
I'm curious how close your compiler would get to that ideal. So you're referring to sort of deforestation techniques and things? Maybe. So w one technique is to basically defunctionalize the continuations that are in the thunks and just lay everything out in local variables and, and just keep reading inputs and dealing with outputs without allocation. We don't have support for those kinds of optimizations yet. Um, it's something we should consider and will consider. Um, but so far, we, we have a sort of a basic version which we're hoping to extend. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Let me try one more from myself then. Uh, presumably, this new uh, set of earlier phases before KML is generating a bunch of first class functions that could be systematically different from what were being fed into KML before and might be exercising some uh, potential weaknesses in the implementation and optimizations of KML. Were you inspired to add any new optimizations in the pre-existing layers to make this work well? We haven't. It's something we could consider. But I think for this, for this kind of work, we thought we should treat the KML implementation as a sort of black box and see, can we build on this as a reusable compiler unit like you would for LLVM or something like that? Um, at the same time, we didn't want to be limited by its choices in verification. So we've made some very different choices in specifying our semantics and so on to see, can we do something very different with the semantics and still compose with KML's verification? So there's that kind of tension there. Perhaps in the future, we could delve more into KML and think about that. Got it, thanks. All right, well, it looks like we can make up a few minutes on our schedule at least. Let's thank the speaker again.